for a couple of weeks or so. Well, if you, if you know that traveling is not easy, it's very, very tiring. Uh, we had a nine and a half hour uh, time change, just in the time change, and we had an 18 and a half hour flight. And that's going from Boston to Dubai, Dubai to Bangalore, Bangalore back and forth and so forth. And so it's very tiring. Uh, every other day we traveled about four hours out from the hotel, did the services, did the graduation, traveled four hours back. We did that every other day. So we put on quite a few miles, and, and uh, that takes a toll on your body. And, of course, the food is different, and so you have to get used to that. And then you get the, the traveling bug and all that kind of stuff. And so you have to deal with that. And, uh, but I thank you for all your prayers, because if it wasn't for your prayers, I don't think I would have made it. Uh, the hotel was great. It was a great hotel. There was no bugs, no, no, no uh, uh, rodents, no nothing like that. It was a very, very, very nice hotel. Uh, and... Um, I appreciate that, that was able to close my eyes, turn the lights off, and not worry about something crawling on me. Uh, so that was, my, that was one of my last trips to India, so well, praise God. Amen. But this morning, I want to talk to you about God's mercy. Something God's been dealing with me about. His mercy. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm sure you do. I want you to open up to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I'm going to start reading from verse 9. Praise the Lord. I'll be sharing some more slides and things while you're looking. I'll be sharing some more slides about uh, India in a couple of weeks. I'm just going to get things together and i got quite a few so I want to put them in an orderly fashion and get them so you can see some of the things that we've done. I got to visit some of, I got to visit a slum uh, and I'll tell you that was something to see. Um, I'll share a little few of the pictures with you from that. Uh, people every single day uh, these Hindus, the Hindus that worship over 700 million gods, and, uh, and uh, to see them come to Christ, to see them uh, you know, come to the altar and repent of their sin and, and get right with God is just a tremendous thing. So if you have your Bibles and you're open to um, Luke 8, 18, I'm going to start with verse 9. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that, God, we would, by your Holy Spirit, be led and guided into obedience. Father, thank you that we love you. We want to serve you. We want to do what's right. But, God, we need your grace. We need your help. We cannot do it on our own. Holy Spirit, come and, and move us and speak to us to be able to fulfill your will for our life. God, help us to apply your word, not just come to church on Sunday morning and let it slide the rest of the week. Father, we want to be changed. We want to be transformed. We want to make a difference in our community. And so, Father, we thank you and praise you for your anointing and for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. God bless. And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. I'm going to stop for a moment. How many times you met a right, self-righteous person? A person that would think that they're, uh, they're right and everyone's wrong. That everyone does everything, uh, they do everything right, but everyone else does everything wrong. And a uh, self-righteous person, one who thinks that they're in right place with God, but they're really not. There's some people that really are self-righteous. They think they're right with God, and they're not right with God. It says, and, and they're trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Wow. Despised others. Looking down at others like we're better. And as Christians, we're not better than anyone. We're saved by grace, through faith, and not of works, 
lest any man should boast. And I believe that God spoke something to me that someone's going to get set free this morning from self-righteousness, from that performance attitude, trying to get God's favor by our performance. Next verse, please. There were two men that went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. Lord, God, I thank thee. Wait a minute. Maybe I'd be better if I have an illustration. Illusion, come up here. Come here. Stand over here for me. I'm going to be the Pharisee. He's going to be the other guy. The Pharisee stood and he prayed within, thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not as other men who are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. I thank God I'm not like him. Next verse. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And then the publican standing afar off would not even lift up so much as his eyes to heaven. But just simply smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I'll tell you this man right here went down to his house justified. Are you hearing me this morning? Then the other, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Thank you. I want to just touch for a moment that scripture. That publican was a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors during the Romans' times were, as a class, they were detested, not only for the Jew, by the Jews, but by other nations also, both on account of their employment, of their harshness, of their greed and deception. with which they did their jobs. These publicans were nasty. They weren't nice. But he's the one that stood up there, and he's the one that prayed that prayer. He wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he said this. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you know what the word merciful means? Anyone here know what the word merciful means? It's not God's favor. That's grace. But when you look this word up in the Greek, it means to make an atonement for. To make reconciliation for. So what that guy was saying is, Lord, be the atonement that I need. Be the reconciler that I need because I'm a sinner. He wasn't relying upon his performances. He wasn't relying upon what he did in society. He wasn't relying upon how much money he gave or what he could do, or what he could not do. What he was relying upon was the atoning factor that God loved him, and God wanted to save him. But I want to read also, I just want to, I want to get that scripture, because um, I have another one that I want to read too, but I want to 
Don't want to lose it. I want to finish that verse. When you look at this scripture and you see that God is not saying that the person doesn't change. Amen? God's not saying that it's just a person who doesn't change, just a person that says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, walks away and stays the same. That's not what the scripture's talking about. He first acknowledged that he needed a savior. He first acknowledged he needed reconciling. He first acknowledged that he wanted God's atonement, atonement for his sin. He recognized and humbled himself to know that he was a sinner and that he needed his sin to be forgiven. But my question to you this morning is, what is forgiveness? If I was to come and... and uh, hit Joe over the head with something, and ask him to forgive me, most likely he would. But if every time I saw Joe, I hit him over the head, what's the one thing Joe's going to stop, start to think? That my asking for forgiveness is not real. That it doesn't mean anything. How many times can a person forgive? Well, 70 times 7, yes. That's in your heart. But believe me, if someone's hitting me over the head every day and they ask for forgiveness, after a while, I'm going to forgive them, but I ain't going anywhere near them. <laughs> okay? Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have, to, you have to be in that person's company. Amen. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends. But see, this man, he wanted to have God's forgiveness. He's asking God, be merciful to me. So he's asking for forgiveness. He's admitting that he's a sinner. He's, he's humbling himself. And he's relying upon the mercy of God to do something in him. And that's to change him. In Romans, 8, 30, 8, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Before you put that up there for in a moment, I just want to ask you this question. What do you think Jesus is doing up in heaven? Is he just sitting around enjoying the angels and the, the songs, you know? Is he listening to Hill's song? Is he, you know? What's, what's he doing? Yes. So who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also making intercession for us. Do you understand that Jesus is praying for you? He's interceding for you. But what is intercession? It's not only prayer, but he's our mediator between God and us. He's the one that stands in between. But what is he what is he representing us for? What's he representing us for? He's representing us. This is what he's doing. He's saying this. I'm going to use another example. He's saying, now God, Debbie Marshall, she loves you. She cares about you. She's not perfect. She does things that are not right. She makes wrong decisions at times. But she loves you. And I know she loves you. 
And I'm interceding for her because she's mine. And because she's been reconciled and because she's been atoned for. She may not be everything that she should be, but she's not everything that she was. Are you hearing me this morning? She may not be everything that she needs to be now, but she's she's not what she used to be before. And so God, receive her on my behalf. That's what he's doing. He's interceding for us. Isn't that wonderful? That takes the performance base right out to try to be accepted by God. You're already accepted in the beloved, the Bible says. You're already accepted in the beloved. So why do we struggle so much? You know, it's like, if you have a relationship with somebody, and you do things for them, and they take it for granted, you know, they just expect you to do everything. And it's one-sided all the time. Don't you get frustrated? How many times have you and I said these these very words? That's it. That's it. No more. (laughs) I'm not going to go there no more. I'm not doing any more. They just take advantage. They they don't care. They don't give anything back. It's all one-sided. But how do you feel when somebody reciprocates for you? That goes out of their way for you that will go the extra mile for you, that shows that they love you and care about you. Don't you want to be with that kind of person? Don't you, don't, you don't mind doing anything for that person because you know that person really, truly appreciates it. You know that's when you understand the love of God and that how much he loves you, how much he cares about you, how much he's done for you, how much he's doing for you then you want to serve him with all of your heart. You want to do it. It doesn't become a, oh, i got to do this or I have to do that. I'm telling you, it takes away the performance base when you understand that you are already accepted by God, that he loves you. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow, if you're not careful. But he wants us to listen to his voice. So who, who is, who's, a, who's a recipient, if you will, of God's mercy? Let's look at Deuteronomy 7, 9 for a moment. The Bible says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. Before you can go any further in your relationship, you've got to really understand and know that he is God. He's the one that's in control. Not President Trump. Hello? He's not in control. God's in control. God is sovereign. God's providence is going to take place. His whole whole, uh, criteria is going to be unfolded in the scripture. Everything's going to come up according to God's plan. Because God is sovereign. Yes, man makes the choices, but God's going to have the ultimate say in the end. Hallelujah. If you read the book, we win. Hallelujah. We don't win because of Donald Trump. We win because of Jesus Christ. Now, thank God for him because he's doing a lot of good things. A lot of people don't want to recognize that, but he is. Doing a lot of good things. Appointing good conservative judges on the Supreme Court. Doing a lot of great things. Know this, that the Lord your God, he is God. You're going to have to really understand and know your God in these last days. Things are going to get worse and worse. Persecution on the church is getting worse and worse. Uh, you, you've seen that uh, there's witches that are gathering together to, um, to curse uh, Kavanaugh and his family. They're having a special service. I forget what night it is. It's going to be broadcast on, uh, on, uh, on the Internet. 
But I say this. You cannot curse what God has blessed. And when you try to curse what God has blessed, the curse comes back on you. He says, know that you're the Lord, your God, he is God. The what? The faithful God. The faithful God. God is faithful. We sing that song, he'll do it again. He's never failed me yet. But can I tell you, there's no yet in God. He's never failed me. It's my perception of things. It's my own choices that have made the decisions where I failed, but God has never failed me. He's the faithful God who keeps covenant and what? Mercy. With everybody? No. There's a conditional clause here. To who? To them that love him. Hello? And keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. See, if the Lord tarries, the next generation is going to look at you and I to see what we've done for Christ. How we lived our life. If we lived a life of faith, if we lived a life of hope, if we lived a life that was exemplifying Jesus Christ, if you want your family saved, if you're concerned about your family, if you're concerned about your loved ones, you're going to have to be the one that's going to be their epistle. They're going to be watching your life. They're going to be watching your commitment. They're going to be watching what you do. They're going to be watching how you interact with other Christians. If you want to see them saved, think about it. If you want to see them saved, you're the example that they're looking at. That's the only epistle they have. They don't read the Bible. They're looking at your life. And if they're looking at your life and they're saying, I don't want what that person has, wow. Wow. I want what that person has. I want to know God like that person knows God. I want to be like, like that person. Paul said, be followers of me as I'm follower of Christ. Why? Because he was an example of what a true Christian was. Self-sacrificing. Love to be around God's people. Why do you need to be around God's people? Why? Why do you need to be around God's people? No, stand up. You know why you need to be around God's people? Because we're going to rub off on each other. <laughs> iron shopping the iron. Amen. That's the only way you're going to grow. That's the only way that you're going to develop to be the person that God has intended you to be is by being around other Christians that are going to kind of rub you the wrong way. Some Christians should have, could have been wash, wa uh, washing machine agitators. Because they know how to push your buttons. They know how to do But God uses that. God uses that in your life. Because how many of us know that we have rough edges? You know, one time, one time I know this brother used to agitate me to no end. 
And uh, I mean, really bad, okay? And uh, I, I used to hear this all the time, you know, sandpaper Christians, sandpaper Christians. You ever hear that expression, sandpaper Christian? That person's a sandpaper Christian. You know what sandpaper does? It takes all the rough edges off. I said, yes, but not electric sanders. I don't mind a sandpaper Christian, but I, I, I don't like those electric sanders. They're pressing all the time, taking the very identity of the wood away. You've got to be very careful when you do that. Amen. Who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and what? Those that keep. His commandments. First John says that his commandments are not grievous. In fact, Jesus took the ten and narrowed it down to two. He said, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is like the first one, you love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to rob from them, you're not going to be a thief, you're not going to steal. You're not going to cover your neighbor's goods. He says, and these two have fulfilled all the law and the prophets. Those two commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul. With all. Why? Because you have a covenant relationship with him. It's not about a, a Sunday morning commitment. It's not about a Wednesday Bible study commitment or a Monday night prayer commitment. Those are important because that, that, that kind of shows where your interest lies. You should desire to want to be there. Whenever there's a service, you should want to be there. There should be that desire. And if it's not there, ask God to put it there. To be in the place where you're among God's people. Some people feel they have nothing to offer. Some people feel like they just have nothing. Well, if you don't have anything, go get something. If you don't have anything that you can offer, find out what your gifts are. The Bible says the desire is spiritual gifts. Someone was telling me, uh, one of the uh, former presbyters of the Assemblies of God um, was telling Linda uh, when she was on the, uh, at the convention, he was uh, very close to the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, and uh, he was talking to somebody, and they said this, they said um, that now in the Assembly of God churches, they're, in, they're, they're asking all of the pastors in the Assembly of God churches on the Sunday morning service not to speak in tongues, not to let any of the gifts in operation because people might get offended. That's sad. That hold a Sunday night service for those who want to do that. That's amazing how you can tell the Holy Spirit how to move and when to move. He keeps his commandments, keep his commandments to thousands of generations. Psalm 25, verse 10. It says, all the paths of the Lord, say all, all the paths. So if you want to know what God's doing, what direction he's going in, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Amen. It's mercy and truth. That's where God is. He's in mercy and he's in truth. He's in the atoning, reconciling business. He's in a covenant business. He's in a relationship business. He says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now, let me say this. Let me clarify God does not expect you to keep your covenant with him to a point where you're sinless because he knows that's impossible. 
Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. I don't know why we just think that's just applying to salvation. Because we all can fall, we all can fail. But God's word says that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we confess our sin, he's faithful in what? Just to forgive us of our sin and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, he is. So God's not expecting you to be perfect in your own sense, in the, in, in the sense of you doing it yourself. But he said, be perfect as I am perfect. And what does that mean? That means by allowing his righteousness, his, his justice, his sanctification to come into our hearts and into our lives and to be manifested through our obedience. That's what he wants. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to keep on changing from glory to glory, changing from glory to glory, changing our ideas, our thinking. Get out of that, get out of that rut thinking that it's only a religion on Sunday, Wednesday, and Monday. Get out of that religious thinking. It's a relationship. Let me think. For a moment, you met the man of your dreams, Uncle Romy. Think back to that day you first saw him, right? How would you feel if you only saw him Mondays, Wednesdays, and Sundays? Not good. That's all you'd want. That's all you'd want. You'd want to see him more. You'd want to spend time with him. You'd want to go places with him. You wanted to do things with him. That's what a relationship is. It's not just Sunday, Wednesday, Monday. Now, how can we have relationship with God? By fellowshipping with the body. Because we are the body of Christ. I mean, you know... This is the truth, though, okay? Some people have stinky feet. But yet they're still a part of their body. Some people have stinky armpits. But it's still part of your body. And in the same way with Christ, there's still some stinky people with some bad attitudes. And bad thinking. But you can't cut them off. You can't be uh, clicky. Oh, I only like Leisha, you know, because her and I, we got the same thoughts, you know, the same. We're on the same wavelength, you know, we're, 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 we're the same. But Jeanette, she's a little. <laughs> a little out there, you know. No. I want to be with Jeanette too. How else is she going to get pulled back in? <laughs> Amen. We're all different. God didn't tell you to be a clone of me. Yeah. That's right, you'd be bald. <laughs> yeah, that or I'd have hair. <laughs> God doesn't want you to be a clone of who I am. He wants you to be a clone of who he is. And he would leave the 99 and go after that one. Amen. Do you care that your loved ones are going to hell? Do you care? Do you care? How, how much do you care? You care this much? Is this how much you care? Or is this how much you care? 
hey, we're having a service Sunday. Would you like to come? You know, salesmen, they'll take a thousand no's before they get a yes sometimes. How are you going to feel when you stand up in heaven and you see them going down the white throne judgment aisle? And they're looking back at you and saying, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you come? Why didn't you help me? See, this church will grow, not based on the past and what I do. It's going to be based on what you do. I don't believe church growth is having other people from other churches coming. I believe church growth is when you have somebody who like this, 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 this publican, tough as nails, won't move, won't budge. Then all of a sudden something happens. He gets into an encounter with God. He gets into an encounter with God's presence. You ever notice people that are not saved, they come in here, they feel uncomfortable? Because it's the presence of God. To have that relationship with God. Let me ask you a question. If, if, I, if I was a multi-millionaire, wouldn't you want me to share it with you? <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> Honesty, right there. Absolutely. If I was a multimillionaire, you'd want me to share that with you. You have something that is far greater than money. You have a treasure in this earthen vessel. And it's Christ. You have Christ living inside of you. And when you have Christ living inside of you, he is your peace. He is your joy. He is all of those things that are missing in your life. He is the one that fulfills that empty void inside. It's not a religion. It's not a religious format. It's a real life person. You come into contact with that real life person, it changes your life. It changes your thinking. How you change who you are to what God wants you to be is to stop thinking the way that you think and start to think the way God thinks. You say, how do I do that? Have this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you, the Bible says. Have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus in you. When you walk down the road and you see the Good Samaritan, they are all wounded and everything, and you just walk by and don't do anything for them. Be like the one in the Bible that when he saw him, he went over with compassion, took him, took him to a hotel, if I can use our terminology of today. Paid for a few nights for him to get healed and some food, and on his way back, he says, I'll pay the, I'll pay the bill when I get back. Or when you're in a grocery line, or when you're in a Dunkin' Donuts coffee line and you pay for the person in back of you. Be open for God to use you. Don't you want God to use you? As a Christian, don't you want God to use your life? Is life just more than paying bills and paying mortgages and paying car payments? And, and, and going to work and coming home and sleeping and family. Isn't God more than football or baseball? Isn't God more than all of those things that are so important to us? Because what are you going to do when you stand before him? What are you going to have to offer him? God's been merciful to us. That's like a, a, bilzy, a billion bucks, if you will. His mercy for us. I want to share that with somebody. I want you to know how merciful God has been to me. How much God has forgiven me. For the things that I've done in my life. How God has changed me. And how he can change you. In Psalm 86, verse 15, 
But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion. Compassion. Oh, we need compassion. Jesus, when he was in ministry, the Bible says he moved with compassion. There has to be a motivation of the heart, and that's compassion. Compassion for your loved one. Compassion for, your, for the one that's lost. Compassion. Because they don't have anybody else to look to. Just think if that person that was in your life that brought you to Christ wasn't there. Where would you be? Where would you be? Would you be homeless? Would you be in financial ruin? Where would you be? If it wasn't for God's hand of mercy on your life, where would you be? Think about some of you. Think about when I first met you, where you were. You know what keeps me going? Because I get discouraged at times. What keeps me going is when I start to reflect on your life and I think about you. I think of all the roads we travel together and all of, all of the things that we've done and how God has moved in our lives and moved in your life. And I say God has been worth it all. It's been worth it all. How all of the circumstances and situations of how you got here and why you're here. In fact, I got a, I got a picture of your dad and you when you were a little girl on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's you. Your dad's really young there, so I think it's you. Why? Because her dad was the one that was very instrumental in getting her here, family, and painting the church, and doing a lot of work in the old other building, and hours and hours of his service he donated. I don't forget that. I can't forget that. And that's what we need in the church, in the body of Christ, is every single one of us being willing to give and to do, to come and, and be a part of something. I remember how excited Bobby was when, when he met um, the guy in the China, Kevin. Just looking for directions. Looked lost. And yet, could have turned away and said, you know what, I don't have time for this. But he didn't. And he stopped and said, you look lost. Can I help you find something? And then found out where he was from and that he was alone and that he had no family here and invited him for dinner, invited him to come over. That's how it's done. Oh, I don't know, you were in the Brook, uh, Buntwood Park or something where you met Tara, right? She was on a bench somewhere at a school, a school at lunch at a bench somewhere. How? Or driving down the road and seeing Milan struggling with some grocery bags. And Rebecca stopping and saying, do you need a ride? Can I help you? And finding out that she was a Christian. And then coming to the church and God touching her. And then she goes home and tells her husband, I want you to come to this church. No, I ain't going there. I ain't going to American church. It's 
See, you were dead in the water once you did that. Because she would come and say, pray for my husband. And we would pray. And he's here. Every one of us have a story. Every one of us have, have something of how we are, or how we've gotten where we are today. My dear sister here, listen for Jeanette. All revolves around us having compassion as our Father has compassion. How many times somebody ever said to you, you know, you look just like your father, or you have the same qualities of your father? Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. But I want to have the same qualities as my heavenly father. I want to be compassionate. I want to be gracious. I want to be long-suffering. I want to be plenteous in mercy. Plenteous. Plenteous in mercy. Sometimes I'm not. I'm being honest with you. Sometimes I don't have a lot of mercy. But I need more. Sometimes I'm not long-suffering because I'm sick of suffering. I want my suffering to be short. I want short suffering. I don't want long-suffering. Sometimes I don't want to be gracious. Sometimes I want to put people in their place. Oh, I'm sure there's nobody here like that. Just let me drive with you for an afternoon. But I want to be plenteous in truth, too. That's the one quality that I love about Debbie. She wants truth. We talk about sometimes intimate things about with God and, you know, Intimacy, and she says, God wants truth in the inner parts, and he wants us to be truthful and honest with who, who he is. And, and we'll just be talking like that, and all of a sudden we just begin to weep, and our tears will come, you know? Because that's what God wants. He wants that kind of relationship. That you can go to him with anything, and no matter what you're feeling, no matter what your emotion, no matter what, how your, your situation or your circumstances, and just crawl up into his lap and say, Daddy, I need you. I need your help. I can't make this trip on my own. I can't do it. I can't do it. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says this. Through the Lord's mercies. Say it with me, mercies. We are not consumed. If it wasn't because of the redemption, reconciling plan of God for our lives, we'd be consumed. Hallelujah. If it wasn't for the atoning of God's purpose in our lives, we'd be consumed. Because, why? His compassions fail not. He's faithful. He is faithful. In all the years, and all the years, and all the years, when you and Uncle Romeo were married, he was faithful. You were faithful. Isn't that rewarding to know that? Isn't it rewarding to know that? That for all those years, you were faithful and he was faithful. All those years that you've been serving the Lord, has he ever let you down? Never. Our expectations let us down. 
what we want let us down, but God never let us down. He is faithful. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Go to 22. Okay, 22, I'm sorry, that's it. No, you're right. You're right, I'm sorry. They are new every evening. Why the morning? Because that's your beginning. That's why you seek the Lord in the morning, so you can have his compassion. You can have his fear. You can experience his mercy and his grace. That's why, so you get ready for the rest of your day. Don't add God on the, and at the end. Your day's over. They are new every morning. Just a little bit is his faithfulness. No, great is thy faithfulness. We sing that song, great is thy faithfulness, O Lord my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. Come on. His mercy endures forever. Great is thy faithfulness. Faithfulness. So what does God expect from us? What does God expect us from us now? We have this message on God's mercy. Luke 6, uh, Luke 6, 36. Six thirty six. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. When you deal and I deal with people, we should deal with them with the intention of being merciful in the in the aspect of reconciliation and atonement. Or them. We can yell and scream at, them, at each other. That doesn't do any good. We can argue and fight. That doesn't do any good. But when we understand that we treat each other with respect and love, we, we have God's compassion and mercy toward one another, it will draw us into that covenant relationship with him. This really stuck to me right here, Job 6.14. Can you put that in the NLT for me, please? One should be kind to a fainting friend. But you accuse me without any fear of the Almighty. Put it in the King James. I like that one a little bit better. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. But he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. In other words, even if you know somebody has gone away from God, still pity them. Pray for them. Be kind to them. Even though Sometimes you have to administer discipline, but still be kind and loving and caring for that person. Because mercy and truth walk together. I like to say it this way, mercy is the left leg, truth is the right leg. Put one in front of the other. And when you do that, you go somewhere.
Zechariah 7, 8. The Bible says, thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice. Zechariah 7, 8 to 10. Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion. Everyone, say everyone, to his brother or sister. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Hello? The alien. Do we have aliens in the United States? Do we have illegal aliens here? Do we have immigrants that are here illegally? What is God telling us to do? Go back to that verse, Bible, verse 9. Execute true judgment. Do you know what they've gone through? Do you know how, how they got here? Do you know why they got here? No. Do you want to understand everything about them? No. Well, what does God expect us to do? Show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Now, when this was written, it was written to the the Israelites. They weren't saved. But because they were Hebrews, they were brother of the same nationality. I know some people on Facebook, they say, send them all back. They all need to go back. Where's your compassion? Where's your mercy? Next verse. Oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Just a couple of more scriptures. Matthew 5, 7 says this. Are you getting anything out of this today? Praise God. Blessed. How many want to be blessed? You know what the word blessed means? Happy. Ah, the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. If you don't show mercy, you ain't going to get mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And finally, James 2.13, the end results to not having mercy. For he shall have judgment without mercy. Oof. Anybody want to experience God's judgment? For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Aren't you glad that you received God's mercy? Aren't you glad that you've been reconciled and atoned for in God? That his mercy endures forever? That you're saved, you're on your way to heaven? You may have your trials and tribulations down here and your things that you're going through down here and all of your you know, problems and bills and all kinds of things. I, there's a great answer on, on, on bills. If you, want, if you don't want to have bills, don't make them. I mean, some bills you can't, you can't not have. You've got to have gas and electric and rent. And those are bills that you've got to pay. But don't make extra bills. Some people, they get, they get $100 in this hand, they spend 200 in this one. They spend 100 of that and 100 on credit. And before you know it, what happens is they get buried.
For he shall, have, he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. I want God to show me mercy. You want God to show you mercy? God's mercy is new every morning. His compassion fails not. That's your heavenly father. Now, I didn't have a close relationship with my father. I had a closer relationship with my mom. My father was working two jobs all the time, was out doing his own thing. And he only, and I came to this conclusion many, many years ago. I came to the conclusion that my father is not at fault. He grew up only knowing what he knew. I mean, you look at this, you look at his family, he didn't have a father growing up. He had situations and circumstances that were not good. And he only knew what he knew. I say this to you. To those who may be watching and maybe their fathers have abandoned them, they feel like their fathers have abandoned them. Let me say this to you. They didn't abandon you. You were a baby. What, what did you ever do to them? Nothing. They abandoned their responsibility. That's what they abandoned. They didn't, want your, they didn't want the responsibility. They didn't abandon you. They don't know you. And I can tell you right now, for those of you who feel that way, I love you. And I know that if I was to have a child like you, I would love you, care for you. Because you are special. You're special. cares about you. So many times we hear messages about God's wrath and pouring out his wrath and judgment, but you know what? Today, God wants you to know he's merciful, full of compassion. His compassions are new every morning. His faithfulness is there. His grace and his mercy is there in truth for you. And all you have to do is receive it. Amen? Let's all stand. I hope this message helped you this morning. I hope it spoke to your heart. Maybe ignited something in you, some compassion for your unsaved loved ones, being merciful. But before we dismiss, I just want to say, because I know that some are not feeling well. If you're not feeling well, you want prayer, come on up, we want to pray for you. The Bible says... If there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So if you're not feeling well this morning, come on up. I'm going to ask Pastor Tom to come up. Just stay in. I just want you to lay hands on them as I lay hands on them. Let's all pray, will we? Father, in the name of Jesus, Brother Nelson, come on up here. Just follow me as I go along. Put your hands on our sister. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says that if there be any sick among us, Call for the elders of the church and to lay hands on them. Pray, anoint them with oil. And I anoint them with oil, Father, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I pray that total wellness would come to her body, her spirit to her mind. In the name of Jesus. Come on this way. Lord Jesus, I pray, my sister, Lord, I pray, Father, that whatever's going on in her body, that, Lord, as your word says, to anoint with oil, I do that right now, Father. I anoint her with oil in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I pray that you give her healing, Father. In the name of Jesus. Father, your word says, call for the elders of the church. Let them lay hands. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name that all sickness leave her body. 
In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, we lay hands on according to your word. We anoint with oil, Father, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Father, take this sickness away from my sister in the name of Jesus from her body. Cleanse her, Father, from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. And make her immune to those kids' sicknesses, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for my brother, Lord, right here, right now, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray, God, that you will heal him by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, according to your word. So let the elders come. We, we're doing what you said. We're laying hands in the prayer of faith. You'll save the sick. Thank you for his healing. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we anoint with oil. Lord, take all worry and fear away. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray, Lord, as we anoint with oil, that Father, according to your word, you'll heal her by the laying on of hands. God, I thank you and praise you for all that you're doing in her life. Thank you for the high roads and the low roads, the twists and turns, that you're making her more like you. In Jesus' name. desert, God has an oasis. Shut up. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. 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 Be loosed, Jesus. Touch your neck, Lord. Touch that pain in your arm. In the name of Jesus. stress go in Jesus name all worry go all stress I remove that cloak over you in the name of Jesus
says, greater things are yet to be done. Greater things. Greater things. God has for you greater things. Some through the fire. Some through the flood. And Jesus is in the fire with you. As he was with Shadrach, ben, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego. As he was with Daniel in the lion's den. God, I pray also for healing in her heart, Lord. From those who take advantage of her love, her kindness, of her generosity. That don't show her that love. That don't reciprocate that love. And Father, whatever that feeling is that's there, Lord, that she feels like she's not loved or appreciated, God, that has plagued her for years, God. We ask that it be removed in the name of Jesus. The Lord, your word says we have a living hope. gets power is when you come into agreement with what he says. In the name of Jesus, he is a liar, the father of lies. You are the, one of the most caring persons I know. You extend and you give and give and give of yourself, of your finances, and your help. Don't let the enemy tell you anything different. But Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. There's a time to say no. There's a time for the prodigal when nobody would help him. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Whew. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whew. Yes, God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Anyone feels to pray anything? Go ahead. There's a great anointing here. He will pour water on you that is thirsty. Floods upon your dry ground. He will pour his spirit upon your seed. A blessing upon your offspring. <sighs> glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. <sighs> Jesus' name. Now, Father, we just pray that you bless the rest of us in the congregation as we go our separate ways. Be with us today, Father. Surround us with your holy angels and protect us as we go. And we'll give you the honor, the glory, and the praise until we gather together tomorrow night for prayer. God, we pray that your manifest presence would be among us. That, God, that your glory would shine down upon us, God. That as we meet with you, you meet with us, Father, on Monday night. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning.